Hello everybody, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and today I want to talk to you about filters. What they are, what different filter designs are, why they're special, and uh, yeah, just kind of listening to the difference between different types of filters and why they really make a big difference in the character of a synthesizer's sound. So the first part of this video is going to be talking about how filters actually work, like slope, cutoff, resonance, that kind of stuff. And then the next part of the video will be talking about different types of filters, like Steiner Parker, ladder, uh, transistor ladder, diode ladder, SEM, all those kind of filters that are in classic sense that you may or may not know about. And then the third part of the video is going to be going through each one of those filter types using the Volt Freak Manifold filter so you can hear exactly what they do to a rich waveform, uh, the basis of subtractive synthesis. So if that sounds cool to you, and I hope it does because it's cool to me, let's start talking about filters. So let's talk about the different types of filters and how they're made, meaning low pass, band pass, high pass, and others. So in pigments here, we have access to a whole bunch of different types of filters. And uh, we're gonna start with multi-mode here, just so I can show you how a filter is shaped and what it does and what the controls do. So the first thing we wanna talk about is cutoff. You'll notice that our cutoff here moves the slope, upward slope of the filter down and cuts off everything above it. This will be different for different filter types, but in a low pass filter, it takes high frequencies out and lets the lows pass through. The severity of the cutoff up here is dictated by a thing called slope, which is related to the idea of poles. So if reducing a filter's cutoff point by an octave, say down like 10,000 hertz to 5,000 hertz, cuts the audio output down to a quarter, it's operating at a six dB octave cut. Twice that power cut and they're related at 12 dB per octave four times that, and they're rated at 24 dB per octave. Single electronic filter designs typically achieve a 6 dB octave cut, so dual circuits achieve a 12, while circuits achieving a 24 dB octave cut are often known as four pole. Next up is resonance. As we turn the resonance up, you will see that we get an increase or a buildup of frequencies around where the cutoff frequency is. So in this case, our cutoff frequency is all the way up at 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. And as we turn the resonance up, we get a little point there. Resonance is going to be a big character part of the filter. And when we get into the different filter type demonstrations, we'll be definitely applying resonance at different amounts so you can hear what that sounds like. So what other types of filters exist besides low pass? Well, low pass is going to be one of the most common ones that you deal with in order to get that sort of classic electronic music sound, especially when you assign something like an envelope to it. When you assign an envelope to a filter, depending on the envelope shape, you move the filter in time to get different sounds. Sounds pretty good, right? So what other kinds of filters do we have? Well, we have high pass. If low pass lets the lows pass through and cuts off the highs, high pass does the opposite. Band pass sort of a combination of a high pass and a low pass. I always associate bandpass filters with uh, Psytrance for some reason. I feel like there's a lot of bandpass filters in Psytrance. Then we get into things that you're gonna see a little less often um, and that's notch filters. Notch filters are also called band reject filters. And uh, if you put a whole bunch of these together, then you get a phaser. I really love notch filters. Uh, they are, sound really good on rich waveforms and uh, you should play around with them more often. Another exotic filter you might find is called a comb filter. So a comb filter creates a series of evenly spaced bands or notches that resemble the teeth of a comb when excited by a resonant frequency. The teeth are created by constructive and destructive interference. A group of comb filters is often used in parallel to resonate multiple frequencies of a signal. A short delay with feedback can create a comb filter as well. <laughs> they just... They just, they just rock. <laughs> That's so good. One other type of filter that you might encounter on certain synthesizers, like the Hydrosynth I know has one of these, is 
a formant filter. And this is actually going to create the sound of vowels. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and now we're Spongle. So low pass, high pass, band pass, notch, or band reject, uh, which is also could be a phaser. Um, low pass gate, shelf, comb, and formant. Those are the different types of filters that you'll generally encounter. Now that we've talked about those, let's talk about the different types of filter architectures and their history. I want to mention that a lot of the stuff I'm going to be reading about the historical nature of these filters comes from a couple sources that I'll link in the video description. There's a couple articles out there that go deeper into this stuff, so I encourage you to read those if you are interested in getting a little bit more insight. So first up, we have ladder filters. Ladder filters came from Moog in the mid-60s. It's a low-pass filter. It was first of its kind. Uh, it has a 24 dB slope and a fat sound when driven. Drive usually uh, does some good stuff to a filter, so you should give it a try. The Roland 303 is actually a different form of the ladder filter, where the Moog filter was a uh, ladder transistor or transistor ladder filter. The Roland 303 and the EMS VCS3 Putney were diode ladder filters. Tim Stitchcomb uh, has given insight into this, saying, uh, the resistor chain used to bias the transistors in the Moog ladder filter meant that the voltages in each filter section are separated which effectively means that the sections are buffered from each other. The isolation is simply not present in the diode ladder. The loss of isolation makes for a different pole placement and makes the poles move differently than Moog's when you tweak the diode ladder's resonance. The more you know. Next up, we have Steiner-Parker filters. So Steiner-Parker filter is a term invented by Arturia. From what I understand, it's actually in reference to something called a Salen key filter. They have it in the Brute synthesizers, and it's a reference to an early synth design called the Steiner-Parker Synthicon. It has a gradual 12 decibel slope, and the filter will attenuate less aggressively, but you can still get a range of filtered tones, including aggressive ones because of the brute factor, which pipes the output of the sense amplifier back into the input of the filter. And as somebody who has had uh, the Mini Brute series, um, I, I will say that the filter sounds really good. Uh, it's one of my favorite sounding filters of a hardware synth, especially a budget one that I've played with. Now let's talk about ARP filters. Uh, I have done a video on the ARP 2600 and its filter is very unique. I can attest to that. Um, so Alan R. Perlman was developing a modular synthetic design that could be programmed without patch cables. Him and his engineer, Dennis Collin, came up with a 24 dB octave filter that was suspiciously familiar to the Moog. So apparently they did some research into it and uh, they found it was like so close to the pre-patented Moog filter that um, Moog uh, visited Perlman and uh, afterwards, uh, <laughs> whatever conversation they had, uh, ARP uh, made a new filter for the 2600. So the 4072 was introduced in the upgraded version of the ARP. And that's the one that has like the black and orange interface. SEM filters. I didn't get the chance to show you a SEM filter in here, but let me do that real quick uh, because I'm not sure if the Volt Freak actually shows off SEM filters quite as well. So here's a SEM filter, a uh, little history, Tom Oberheim, the Oberheim stuff. That's where you'll find SEM filters. Your Arturia Micro Freak has a SEM filter as well, which is pretty cool. And what makes it special is it's a 12 dB multi-mode filter, but it does this. It, it morphs between band pass, low pass, notch, and high pass. And it sounds like this. So remember how I said notch filters were cool? Well, we can get a notch in here. And I think a lot of the OB sound comes from the fact that we can like have these really cool morphing notches and band passes and stuff like that. Those generally have like a lot of character to them. Ooh, next up, Korg filters, 35 and the OTA. So the Korg MS-20 is like one of the most famous uh, synth sounds that exists out there. It's known for being really aggressive. Um, a lot of amazing bass sounds have been done with the MS-20, but also lead sounds too. And I think in great part, that's because of the filter. So it has a resonant 6 dB uh, octave high pass and a resonant 12 dB octave low pass in series, allowing for the creation of band pass filtering. The original MS-20 actually had two different filter section designs. The first was a compact chip-based filter Korg made itself called Korg 35. It was based on a classic Salen key filter design. The Korg 35 chip at the center of the filter core in combination with the other components around it helped define what players loved about the MS-20. Later models of the synth swapped the Korg 35 for OTA chips called Operational Transconductance Amplifiers. You can actually find OTA chips in the Jupiter 8 and the Jupiter 4 too. And there's actually a, a resource for looking at what filters were in all of the Roland synths. 
that I'll put in the video description because it's actually pretty cool. Uh, the OTA, this the OTA is crazy. Like it actually made appearances in uh, the Doug Curtis Design CEM 3320, which was a 24 dB octave multi-mode filter chip that was used in the OB8, the OBXA, the Sequential Circus Profit 5 Rev 3 and Profit 10, the Fairlight CMI, Lindrum, and a whole bunch of other drum machines and synths from the 80s. This filter design is like everywhere and um, probably a good reason for that. It sounds really good. Getting to the end here, but let's talk about Polyvox. So Polyvox is a Russian company. Uh, the Polyvox synthesizer was actually created in competition with the West during the Cold War because they couldn't get Moogs and stuff like that. The whole synth design, including the filter, was invented by Vladimir Kuzmin. My first Eurorack filter was a Harvestman uh, Polyvox clone, and it was wild. The thing is just so wacky and uh, characterful. I guess the mutable instrument Shruthi kit also had a Polyvox style filter in it too, which is pretty cool. Other filters that you might encounter out there or might want to know about. Uh, low pass gates we talked about, sometimes called low pass gate amplifiers. It was designed by Buchla and it's associated with West Coast synthesis. It amplitude rises and falls in coordination with its frequency response and along with a gradual 60B octave slope can create natural sounding filter sweeps. Uh, it's in the Buchla Music Easel, Korg's vocal modulars. You'll see them in a lot of Eurorack setups. I actually don't have any low pass gates and I kind of wish I did. They sound really, really cool when you ping them. Uh, here's a good one, the Wasp or CMOS filter. The electronic dream plant Wasp was an extremely popular and affordable synth in England in the late 1970s. Um, it had a 12 dB octave multi-mode design and you will see it in the base station, base station two, there's a dope for clone for it. And I know that like the peak filter is actually somewhat based around the Wasp design too. Uh, the person that invented it was working at Novation until they passed recently. So Wasp filter, don't sweep on it. It's got a lot of character to it and it's been upgraded over the years. Last one before we get into the sound demos and that is just to talk about the, the Z-Plane filters, which are legendary to me uh, because they were a really big deal in some of the sounds of drum and bass back in the day. Um, so the Emu Morpheus module in 1993 had 193 different filter types um, and there was like this ability to morph between them. Um, Rossum Electronics actually makes a Z-Plane Eurorack module now um, that allows you to use this cube design to morph between different filters. And as you've seen in our demo so far, like if you could morph between like a vocal format filter, a comb filter, a bandpass, and like some other like character low pass filter, you would have a very interesting experience. Um, uh, just filters are so really cool and so important. And uh, the Z-Plane filters still um, you know, they still blow my mind and I still wish I could get one as a plug-in or something like that. That'd be super cool. All right, enough talk. I'm going to bring up our demo station here. So what do we have? We have pigments running a really basic analog patch. It is one saw wave. So we're going to be listening to one saw wave um, through the analog engine, which does have a tiny bit of wiggle to its waveform, meaning that it's not just a strict digital saw. There's a little bit of analog modeling going on in some of the kinks in the peaks. Um, but it really won't make a difference. I just wanted a single rich waveform for you to listen to as we go through these different filters. I'm piping it into VCV rack as a VST effect. And we're going to be using the Freak Manifold filter here, which has every type of filter that we've just talked about. And it's crazy because like, I was doing the research for this thing and I was like, how am I gonna demonstrate this? I know that like Pigments has a lot of these filters, but how am I really gonna like get in there and, and show it off? And I was like, wait a second, the Freak module that I have in Eurorack over here has a VCV rack version. And as I researched it, I was like, oh my God, every single filter that we talked about is in this thing. So if you're looking for a filter, whether in Eurorack, though it's hard to get now, but in a VCV rack that does everything that we're talking about or have talked about in this video, the Freak Manifold filter is the one. So we're gonna be running an ADSR into it to uh, modulate the cutoff frequency. This is a very classic relationship with filters and notes. However, I wasn't able to get the gate in of uh, my notes and pigments to trigger the ADSR. So we're sending a little sequence to it. So we're gonna hear some filter modulation from an envelope. I also have a small clocked wavetable LFO on the other two inputs, which is gonna add a little bit of movement too, because I need you to hear the whole range of this thing. And uh, we're gonna go through uh, filter by filter. I will put what the filter is on the bottom of the screen, but I'm not gonna talk during this because I really want you to hear what each filter sounds like. And I want you to hear them back to back so you can really get a sense of how important filters are in changing the sound of your, uh, of your synthesizer. So with that said, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, let's listen to some filters. Thank you. 
Wasn't that fun? All the filters that we talked about in demonstration for you here. I hope that you could hear some of the differences between them. I hope you also noticed how different the resonance knob would react. Uh, the placement of the resonance knob would react uh, per different filter things. Some would scream and self-resonate really, really fast. Some would not. Um, and some of them had a really juicy melodic resonance and some had a more kind of uh, aggressive resonance. So just a huge range of expression available to us. And um, this is only one type of musical information that we're passing through here. So you can imagine, hopefully, that uh, these kinds of filters can be applied in all different kinds of ways to all different kinds of material to get really, really awesome results. I don't really think you need to necessarily always be thinking about, oh no, which filter am I using? Like, am I using the right one? But I do want you to know that there's differences between filters and they make a really big difference in how harmonically rich information is going to come across in your music. And I think it's just fun. I love the sound of filters. I love the way that they make things squiggle and move around. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. And it's probably the number one thing that drew me to electronic music, the sound of a really interesting sound being revealed and manipulated by a filter. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. My name is Jeremy, this is Red Beans Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day.